I'm 17, and I'm not special. I have, however, been able to achieve some special things. The past year and a half has been a bit of a blur for me. Myself and my co-founders have taken a science fair project and turned that into a funded company creating assistive technology to solve the unsolvable problem of paralysis. And that's all due to one thing, a mindset. A mindset of naive curiosity. A year and a half ago, I went to a movie, uh, The Theory of Everything, a biopic about Stephen Hawking. And he's someone who I've always admired. I grew up watching the Science Channel, and he was one of those titans of physics that everyone talks about. And through this movie, I saw a different side of him. I saw how his disability had affected his life, and that stuck with me. When I went home that night, I was frustrated. This man who had pondered some of the universe's biggest questions was in inhibited by what seemed to me to be a simple problem. His brain couldn't talk to his muscles. And that's what happens with anyone who's paralyzed, be it ALS or MS, stroke or spinal cord injury. Their brain can't talk to their muscles. Their brain's still working fine, and the muscles, the motors of their body, they're still running, but there's some loose wires in between that don't let that signal be passed along. Now, I figured electricians have been fixing the problem of loose wires for centuries, so why couldn't someone do it with the human body? And so I went home that night and I drew up some designs of what this device might look like. And I had no idea that night, but solving that problem would become my passion. Now, a year prior, when I was a sophomore in high school, I was in this chemistry class, and I was really bored. I don't know why, but for some reason, things just didn't click with me. And I spent most of my time daydreaming and doodling, which was frustrating because I know I love science, and I've always loved science. Um, so I decided to start an independent study. I went online to Khan Academy, and I learned about anatomy and physiology. I learned about the nervous system and about the muscular system. And it was all just because I was curious. I didn't really know what I would ever use that information for, but I just wanted to learn. And so a year later, my junior year, when I was in this engineering class, after I had that stroke of inspiration from the movie, I drew upon those tools. I was in this engineering class called Design Tech at Centaurus High School, a public high school. And the goal of the class was to take some idea you had and develop a working prototype. And these are some notes <laughs> that I took from that independent study. So the goal of the class was to develop a working prototype, and then you write this big paper on it. And so I just got to work. I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't know how I was going to tackle this problem, but I just took it one piece at a time. I figured there must be some way to get somebody's muscles to move. And I found something. It's called a TENS unit, and it uses electromuscular stimulation through electrodes that you just place on the skin. And you can get somebody to bend their fingers, close their hand, bend their elbow. And then I figured there must be a way to allow somebody with paralysis to control this. And I had never written a line of code. I had never done any electrical engineering. But I thought, what about voice control? Um, that's a sign that might be doable. And so I bought a microcontroller online and a little microphone. and I turn to the internet. And I asked my teachers, and when they didn't have the answer, I just Googled it. And I figured out how to build the system um, where somebody would be able to say a voice command and move their muscle. I developed these prototypes by marrying these two technologies together, and I saw success. By the time the science fair came around, after about four months of development, I had a working prototype. I sat down with somebody who had had a brain injury. They had a brain tumor, and they weren't able to close their hand effectively. I sat down with him. I put these electrodes on him. And he said a command. He said, open. And it opened his hand for him. And I saw his face light up. I saw how that affected him. And that was really where I got the passion and the drive to keep solving this problem for more people. Now, Looking back on that, and I, I always knew in the back of my head, I was probably not in the position to solve this problem. 
A problem like paralysis is supposed to be solved by a big research company with some huge R&D budget, or by a research institution with some of the best Ivy League minds working on solving the problem. And I'd, I didn't have either of those things. I was working out of our high school engineering lab, and I had a budget of about $100. But I had a passion. I had a drive to do it. I was curious. I, I thought there must be some way to solve this problem. And when I came to a bump in the road or something that looked like it was going to be crazy expensive, I just went a different way. I followed my curiosity, and it led me to a solution. And I was able to see success creating this prototype for less than $100 and getting someone who was partially paralyzed to move under their own power. And it was all because of that naive curiosity. I think oftentimes people think that their circumstances are inhibitory. But that's counterproductive, because having less resources leads to a more innovative solution. You don't get to take the routes that most people are. You got to find your own shortcuts. You got to pave your own path. And that's how you come up with this novel solution. Now, while all this was going on, I was watching this show uh, called Silicon Valley. And it's about this guy, this nerdy guy in a sweater, who has some harebrained idea and starts a company and becomes a successful CEO. And I figured, well, I'm a nerdy guy in a sweater, and I have a harebrained idea, <laughs> so why don't I give it a shot? And I did. I got together myself and my four friends, uh, my three friends, and they were crazy enough to tackle this problem with me. And they were smart enough to fill my gaps in knowledge and help me along. And I just went online and I Googled, what do you do when you start a company? And I found some stuff. And I found this website that connects startups with funding. And I filled out half of the application for this thing called the Boomtown Accelerator. I didn't really know what it was, but um, I kind of left half of it blank and then went and started tinkering with the prototype. Um, well, two le weeks later, I got a call from the director of the Health Tech Accelerator at Boomtown. They had had a company drop out last minute, and they needed someone to come in. And he started off the call saying that things probably weren't going to work out, and it was probably too late. But I pitched him the idea, and I pitched him our company, which at the time, the company was four high schoolers, a science fair project, and a logo. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess I made that sound pretty good, because he asked us to come in on that Monday. And I said, of course. And then I realized that that Monday was the first day of our finals week. And I thought, even better. <laughs> so we came in. And we started working for eight hours a day, taking these business classes, learning more and more about how to develop a startup. And we, we met with experts in their fields, people who had spent years in FDA regulation, in product development, in marketing. And we drew upon their device and developed our company. We spent the entire summer, three months working on this. And it all culminated to our graduation at Demo Day where I gave a pitch in front of 1,000 people at the Boulder Theater. And we ended the night with a standing ovation. We received the investment from Boomtown. It was surreal. And it was crazy, thinking back on it. I mean, we were meeting with people who had more experience in their field than years we'd been alive. <laughs> and at the time, I, I was kind of scared of that. I thought that this inexperience was going to hinder us. But I've come to realize that that's not the case. Inexperience allows for new perspectives in established fields. The people who are trying to tackle this problem of paralysis are going through the same pathways. They go to medical school, they go to engineering school, and they learn how to think about these problems. And then they go and work for a biomedical company. And because they have those similar pathways, they oftentimes have similar solutions. Right now, there's two leading solutions in solving the problem of paralysis. The first is exoskeletons, which are a flashy sci-fi uh, solution, but have so far proved to be not commercially viable and clunky for the user. The other solution is implantable devices, having an expensive surgery, and it's proved not to be accessible 
for most of the users. Now, we were not experienced. We had no idea what we were doing. We weren't taught to think the certain way. We approached the problem from our own angle. We started from scratch with our knowledge base and only learned what we needed to learn as we went along. And it worked out for us. That inexperience led us to this new perspective. If you think about this tech industry and this tech no logical age that we're in right now. Innovation and industries are revolutionized by outsiders, by kids who are tinkering in their garage, and they don't know what they're doing. But they're able to approach the problem in new ways. And because of that, they're able to flip the industry on its head. And so I ended that demo day pitch talking about our plans for the future. And our plans for the future were to develop a brain control system Im and implement that into our device. So someone wouldn't have to say a voice command, but they would simply think about moving their muscles, and it would work for them. And at the time I said that, I didn't really know what I was talking about. <laughs> I, I knew it was possible, and I knew we could get there. I had no idea how. <laughs> and that's kind of scary, but I leaned into it. Over about the course of a month, myself and our CTO, Nate, looked at this problem and we did research. We Googled things <laughs> and we found different ways. We connected with an entrepreneur who had used brain control in his 3D printed prosthetics. And we implemented that technology into our device. And within a month, we had it working. This is Betty. Uh, we worked with her more recently. And she had a stroke about eight years ago. She's a very independent person. She's recovered very well. She lives alone. But she's lost the c control in her left arm. She doesn't have the ability to make those fine mover motor movements or even coarse muscle movements with her arm. And so we went to her home. And we sat down with her. And over the course of about 15 minutes, we trained in a couple different brain commands. And we hooked the device up to her. We put, placed the electrodes on her muscles. And then she thought. She thought about closing her hand. And the device was able to do that. She was able to open and close her hand like she hadn't been able to do in eight years prior. And it took about 15 minutes to set up. This entire prototype cost us less than $1,000 to build with the full brain control implemented. And that's what we're currently developing right now and working on improving and making it even better for our users. Now, I think oftentimes people think that if there's not an answer for your question out there, then there's no reason for you to try and answer it, right? Because there's people with more money and there's smarter people out there who are trying to solve it. But they're not. That's the thing with these big problems and these big questions that we have. They're not being answered. And by being an outsider, by being someone who is naively curious, by not looking at that big picture and just taking it one step at, the t at a time, you'll be able to tackle the problem in a new way. You'll be able to see solutions that others haven't. If I wasn't naive, if I looked at the full scope of work that was ahead of us when I first started out on this journey, I probably would have given up. It's, it's a lot. But I didn't. I just looked at what was next ahead. I looked at the next problem we needed to tackle. And that naivety and that curiosity to find solutions and ask questions that others hadn't before is leading us to solve an unsolvable problem. <laughs>